Okay, we're going to be starting. Vanessa, if you'd like to introduce everything. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I want to uh, welcome those of you who are here for the first time and welcome back anybody who has been to our speaker series. My name is Vanessa Escobar. I'm the user engagement lead for value change and traceability inside of OSAP, the Office of System Architecture and Advanced Planning. Um, this speaker series is uh, based out of NESDIS and it's called Meet the Users. Um, in this series, we invite our external NOAA user community to come in and demonstrate and talk to us about how they use uh, NOAA data and services. Um, we also ask them to talk about how they would like to implement um, our services if they don't already have them. So we ask our presenters to give us a day in their life, to walk us through their world, how they use information, how they process it, and really get into the gaps, the challenges, the benefits, and more particularly, the societal benefits that they see in their application with the use of Earth observations and uh, services either out of NASA or out of NOAA. Today, we have Dr. Antar Jutla from the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Jutla is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Engineering Sciences, and we will hear him discuss about his uses of uh, Earth observations for water quality, air quality, and the use of ocean color. Uh, we're really focusing here on tourism, health, and incentivizing how information moves into the decision frameworks of tourism, of coastal health. So the focus, again, being on water quality, air quality, and ocean color. Um, we really want to understand through this presentation the complex roles of humans in the hydrologic cycle and the balance of nature and human systems. And his presentation will give us the glimpse of how that works uh, in his modeling world. And through his talk, we're really going to look at the use of observations from Veers and from MODIS for his coastal health modeling. Now, Dr. Judla is an early adopter for NASA's PACE mission, which is due to launch here very soon. And he will also be incorporating PACE mission uh, data in his uh, future modeling. Um, this obviously of interest to us as we look to our ocean color observations in uh, GEO through OCX, but also air quality and future observations um, from ACX and other missions coming out of NOAA. So I want to welcome Dr. Jutla. Uh, before doing so, I do want to walk everyone through a few do's and don'ts on Adobe. So Antar, if you give us one quick moment, I'm going to pass this over to Allison and she's going to let us know how we can hear your questions, how we can receive your information. We do want to know who is here and how we can continue to communicate. So a few do's and don'ts from Allison, and then we'll break it over to uh, to Dr. Dupla. Allison, go right ahead. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, if you look at the top of your screen, there is a closed caption button, just in case um, you'd like to turn that on. Um, we have live transcription going on um, that will be collected. We also are recording this session in hopes to post it on the NOAA seminar series website um, sometime after the meeting. You might notice there's a chat and at the bottom of the screen that is open to everyone who's here. Everybody can see your questions. You can have small discussions in there. Um, we will be collecting questions at the end of the talk and um, I will I will make sure to you know try to get through as many questions as possible if we're unable to we'll collect those questions and Dr. Jutla will be able to answer them offline and hopefully we can provide that also on the the NOAA seminar series website um, you won't be able to unmute yourself and talk so please just put everything in the the live chat um, yeah, I think that's it. Back to you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. And um, and for those who are not familiar with the series, um, Allison, could you put in the, the chat, um, if you could put in the link to the speaker series page 
Uh, we welcome suggestions and feedback and any kind of um, recommendations. So if there's speakers that you want to hear from in the future, um, please let us know. So thank you very much. And Dr. Jutla, thank you so much again. I'm going to hand it over to you and uh, I appreciate your time being here. Thank you, Vanessa, and glad to be here. Um, and so we will um, walk through like several of the uh, Earth observation systems that we have been using over the last two decades. And then um, some of the interesting observations that we have made over that time and where the future of Earth observations is, and then how we are thinking to leverage uh, NOAA's uh, uh, latest missions into our uh, uh, into our future research as well as application. So we're going to be um, we're going to be dealing with waterborne pathogens uh, for next forty minutes, and uh, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, at the world of uh, vibrios. These are the organisms which um, which live in water, and if uh, human population either intentionally or non-intentionally come in contact with those uh, pathogens, it can have a devastating impact on uh, human health and communities and uh, and in cultures. So um, one of the things that, uh, before I begin, one of the things that I do want to mention is that um, the, the idea of absolute prediction uh, is uh, is something that, that we do not advocate in our research and in our research philosophy we start with this idea that we have to develop the intelligence system meaning that we don't want to be a descriptive uh, we don't want to provide a uh, a descriptive solution but we want to provide a general assessment so that the decision makers and stakeholders can take appropriate steps as to what those are what that information means so um I would like to begin a slide with with, with this uh, this note that the NOAA's Pathfinder Initiative it's it's a it's a pretty bold initiative and an interesting approach to involve stakeholders and users before a satellite mission is actually launched and this is essential because I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about a, a similar approach that we did that we took um, uh, for for one of the inf waterborne infections um uh in in 2019 and 20. um so um and that would be relevant to the uh um to what what pathfinder initiative is trying to achieve as well we in our research group we believe and then we strongly uh focus on involving users and stakeholders much before in uh, in in the process before even we begin modeling or before even we begin like uh, developing algorithms uh, for for any uh, any public health decision making space. So in 2016 17 there was a huge cholera outbreak, a massive cholera outbreak in Yemen, and at that time we had our algorithms validated and uh, calibrated for like several parts of the world. Uh, cholera is a waterborne uh, diarrheal disease, and if people are not treated rapidly uh, and then promptly with this uh, with, with the medicines, the fertility rates can be as high as six seven percent. So, um, so we we you know when we when we basically try to uh, uh, implement our uh, cholera algorithms to around the globe, um, we found that uh, Yemen was at pretty high risk of an outbreak of cholera. And at that point, uh, we basically started working and, and identifying the influential stakeholders and users much before then, then we started to do the modeling and all those things. And in the end, we were able to identify locations. We were, identify, we were able to identify the time at which the appropriate mitigation and intervention strategies were implemented uh, to contain the massive spread of cholera. On the right hand si uh, side of your screen, you are basically seeing that uh, a logistics that, that we followed, and it is similar to the NOAA's Pathfinders Initiative for, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for engaging the scientific community and the users before uh, a, a, an appropriate mission is, is launched. So in this one, we had the right time of prediction, we had the right population at, uh, 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 
we, we identified the right population. And then the after the identification of the population and the stakeholders, we basically help them with the with with an appropriate intervention strategies because all intervention strategies there there, there can't be a blanket intervention strategies. So for each disease, for each um, pathogen, uh, there needs to, we need to under, understand the sociology of communities, population. We need to understand what drives or what don't drive their motivation, and then we have to drive the uh, intervention. So. Um, we, we are big supporters of this, this idea of Pathfinders Initiative um, based on our, our previous experience. And we're going to go in details uh, in, in a bit as to like how we basically approached and used Earth observations um, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, diseases, for waterborne diseases like cholera and other, other stuff. So um, I, this is a, a, a slide that, uh, that, that we made when COVID hit. Um, in 2019. And so in this slide, uh, what we have done is we have summarized all the major pandemics that have occurred in the world. If you will look um, on, the, uh, uh, on the broad pathogen uh, row, what it shows is that um, late in like early 1300s to 1800s, most of the pandemics were basically um, uh, uh, most of the pandemics were caused by bacteria, but with the advent of um, uh, antibiotics, the um, the pandemics, the bacterial pandemics were uh, were controlled a little bit. But in in 1900s and so on, uh, what we are seeing is that there is more virus-based pandemics rather than the bacterial pandemics. So in the in the medieval uh, or in the uh, industrial era. Uh, the most often pathogen of concern for us was cholera, the Vibrio cholerae. And, and that caused a massive, massive uh, uh, mortality. And it, it lasted for like several years. On the other hand, if you see the viral uh, pandemics, they last for a shorter period of time, but they impact a vast major, uh, a vast uh, spectrum of uh, geographical uh, domain in a much smaller time, meaning uh, let's take an example from COVID. Uh, COVID basically impacted the entire world within six months, whereas cholera or, or uh, diseases like cholera will prevail in the human population and in the environment for a way more longer time. And over years, it will have more mortality rather than the quick uh, um, the mortality over like, you know, very short span of time. Uh, we are also seeing that the geographical reach of all the pathogens is uh, changing. It is uh, uh, the, the geographical reach is increasing. Uh, it could be uh, as a result of both ecological changes in ecological niches, uh, which is influenced by processes, uh, the climate and by the processes. Uh, and then we are trying to understand um, understand why, how and where these these pathogens are moving as um, uh, as, as we do more research. Um, our core idea is to build predictive intelligence. And the predictive intelligence is basically that we need to identify the appropriate intervention point. And this intervention point, identification of this intervention point has a huge impact as to where and when and how um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, how appropriate mitigation strategies needs to be implemented. For example, uh, here are two scenarios, scenario A and scenario B. In scenario A, uh, we have a, a epidemiological incidence or prevalence curve. Um, the intervention point was identified way before the peak hits, uh, the peak of this, this, uh, uh, this hypothetical uh, disease basically uh, is, is reached. So the impact of intervention, identification of intervention points will basically lower or flatten the curve. Our whole research and our whole philosophy is to move this intervention point to all the way before even the first few cases have been reported in, um, uh, in, in human population. Is it doable? Um, in the current scenario, we, uh, we can only imagine this thing happening by use of uh, global earth observations, a, a data set that, that can be linked with both emergence, presence, prevalence uh, with, with the pathogens, as well as the incidence and prevalence time series of, uh, 
um, uh, um, of, of infection in human populations. Um, are we there where we can we can basically implement these uh, uh, these strategies? Maybe not, but we are building the predictive intelligence for uh, for known uh, uh, pathogens which have caused uh, massive pandemics or which have potential to cause pandemics in the future. So um, uh, we're going to focus on uh, waterborne diseases today, waterborne pathogens today. And why? Because 50% of global population lives um, uh, within 50 miles of coasts. And that's a huge number of people that are living um, uh, living along the coastal coastlines of the world. Um, the water-related diarrheal diseases remain a leading cause of death, uh, especially amongst young children and elderly population, as well as uh, uh, population that have uh, comorbidities uh, present in them. Uh, the diseases um, and the pathogens that, that are found in, uh, uh, in, in coastal uh, locations or in the water systems are, are not likely to be eradicated. That doesn't mean that, uh, that the diseases can't be controlled, but the pathogens are likely going to stay in the water systems. And, and, and that complicates uh, the whole uh, dialogue. Why? Because then the, uh, the eradication of these pathogens is not going to be possible. One of the simple solutions of, uh, of uh, um, limiting the spread of diarrheal diseases is to provide adequate water sanitation and uh, safe access to drinking water. Um, but again, like there are some caveats as to like where, when, and how we are going to provide uh, those kinds of uh, scenarios to human population. We have recently seen that there is uh, uh, there is an emergence of or a presence of Vibrio vulnificus and Parahemolyticus um, in, uh, in in coastal waters in in Florida after Hurricane Ian, and we are going to discuss that in few minutes. So, um, so uh, the whole idea is that. Uh, if the pathogens whose life cycle is associated with water, climate, and weather processes, then those things can have a proxy variables associated with them that can be uh, that can be quantified using Earth observations in and around the world, and then we can develop a predictive intelligence uh, as to uh, as to answer the question as to when, how, and where it's going to be. Uh, uh, is going to be uh, uh, where these pathogens will be uh, will be present. So um, the next slide is uh, shows the global presence of vibrios. This is the uh, vibrio vulnificus, vibrio parahemolyticus, and vibrio cholerae. So this is the this is the known locations where the microbiological evidence exists as to the presence of these these pathogens in the water system. And, um, and then this information is publicly available through our uh, data servers. The, the link is provided uh, here for reference. Um, we, um, we, we are working to identify a global uh, predictive map on like where, when, and how the Vibrios are going to emerge in different coastal parts of the world. And uh, on, the, on the top uh, right, uh, top right corner, you will see that uh, that the geo exo constellation of satellites would be critical to provide us with the ocean color information as to like you know um, uh, where where which we will be able to use and harness um, uh, algorithms to uh, to identify new locations or even like the timing of like where the uh, uh, the, the susceptible uh, locations where the uh, uh, where these vibrios will be will be will be present. Um, so the pathogenic vibrios. Uh, that, that are of concern to us right now includes Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio parahemolyticus, and Vibrio vulnificus. And if you look at the Google search for all the diseases that, that exist uh, or that, that people have searched over the last, uh, uh, last several years, and this, this is before COVID, the diarrhea remains number one a searched um, word, uh, word in the Google. And most of the diarrhea um, is, is caused by ingesting um, contaminated water uh, or our food that is contaminated with, with one of those pathogens. So we, uh, we, we think that if we have a, um, a, a predictive solutions or predictive intelligence for these, uh, these pathogens, it could 
uh, it could basically lead to a judicious use of uh, uh, medicine as well as provide the uh, water, uh, safe water and sanitation access. Here, I would like to mention this idea that um, that ju the judicious use of medicine is critical. Why? Because while antibiotics are helpful uh, to prevent the uh, or, or to prevent the death as well as to protect human population, uh, different parts of the world have used antibiotics randomly. Meaning, if if you have a minor diarrhea, they will basically prescribe uh, or they will basically go to the chemist or a pharmacy and and and, and get the uh, antibiotics that will lead to issues of antimicrobial resistance genes uh, and then that's something that that we are also studying in different parts of the world so uh, back to the uh, to the cholera which is caused by vibrio cholerae the pathogen uh, this this is not a new disease it has been there for several um, several centuries several decades the current seventh pandemic which started uh, in 1970s um, is is not showing any signs of uh, decrease uh, in 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 the, in the locations where human vulnerability in intersect with the environmental and climatic processes so over the last several uh, decades we have seen massive cholera outbreaks in the indo gangetic basin um, Africa remains one of the regions where we often see um, small to massive outbreaks of cholera. Uh, and and, and th that basically uh, tells us that we need to have a global system that will be that we will be able to employ at different locations, different spatial and temporal locations uh, to identify locate uh, to identify regions which are at risk of this disease. Using Earth observations uh, for over 40 years, we have uh, we have been able to quantify different modes of occurrence of cholera in human population. This was uh, achieved using uh, using the microbiological data sets um, that we that our group in collaboration with the University of Maryland has collected for over 40 years. And um, we then linked that data set to the satellite derived uh, climate, eco climate, weather and ecological variables. And we came up with this idea that not all cholera outbreaks are same. So with that argument, we identified that there are three modes in which a, a cholera can happen in human population. One is the epidemic cholera where the where we see a constant presence of cases of cholera in human population. Most of the time, this happens in the coastal locations of the world. It doesn't mean that it, it, it will not happen in the inland regions, but the majority of uh, the endemic mode is often seen in, the, uh, in and around the coastal locations. The second one is the epidemic cholera, uh, uh, epidemic cholera which happens uh, sporadically, meaning that uh, the, it, it generally is seen in the inland regions where human population is often not prepared um, to deal with the uh, with with the vibrio, with the vibrios, and then then it it suddenly happens as a result of a damaged water and sanitation infrastructure, and it leads to massive mortality rates. The examples include uh, 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 a, a most recent example include um, Yemen. Before that, it was Haiti, and so and and so on. Um, uh, the epidemic cholera in the epidemic cholera mode uh, the human population know that when they are going to be expecting uh, a contamination of water so they are a little better prepared than the epidemic modes of cholera the mixed mode is a uh, a, a sum of uh, or an integration of epidemic plus endemic cholera where we see where we generally see like dual peaks um, uh, two peaks during during a year this is limited to some parts of uh, Bangladesh as well as in Mozambique. We haven't seen the mixed mode of cholera in, uh, um, in, in, uh, in, in many regions of the world. Now, we have, um, we have a, a cholera prediction model, meaning that we are able to predict when and where the risk of cholera, uh, cholera you are seeing that 
this is not done overnight. It, it started in 1960s where we developed a microbiological theory of, uh, of, of these pathogens as they are related to ecological, environmental, and water climate parameters. Then we did a massive, um, uh, then we did a massive uh, field campaigns. Um, and the, uh, uh, and the, and these campaigns led to uh, linking linking the microbiological theory to the earth observations. And finally, in 2010s and more, more so in late uh, 2018, 2019, we were able to develop a real-time prediction models for uh, for predicting the uh, the uh, risk of cholera in human population. Just to give you an example, here um, uh, here is the hypothesis that um, uh, an underlying hypothesis for our epidemic cholera prediction system. So we um, we proposed that if we have very warm temperatures, which is followed by heavy precipitation uh, or rainfall, uh, and there are elements of uh, water insecurity in the region, meaning that there is a deviation of um, a deviation of human uh, usage of safe water and sanitation access, then the risk of cholera is going to be very high. If one of the conditions is not met, then the risk of cholera is going to be low. Now, this is fundamentally different because this challenges this notion that all floods are going to be, uh, all floods will basically lead to cholera outbreaks. So we argue that that's that's essentially not true. All floods will not create conditions for for, for cholera outbreaks, and uh, and then we validated this uh, this hypothesis in several regions of the world. Right now, we have sixty two data points where we have validated this region. We have uh, uh, captured about ninety to ninety five percent of regions where this hypothesis works. As mentioned before, this was. Uh, uh, implemented in near real time in Yemen, we have a predictive accuracy set, um, and uh, uh, of about like sixty to seventy percent, and it improves as the epidemiological and water and sanitation data are available to us. Um, and but uh, the important thing is that the, uh, um, it, it, the the model is able to statistically. Uh, predict uh, statistically provides a forecast of high, low, and medium risks of cholera um, uh, in uh, at, at a pixel scale, which is one kilometer by one kilometer, in any part of the world. Uh, we implemented this uh, algorithm in, uh, in in Yemen. Then we uh, we implemented this alg algorithm in Sudan in 2007, uh, 2018, where we were we were able to basically show that uh, or ad identify the location uh, the exact location where the risk of cholera was um, was was very high and then when the epidemiological data sets came into uh, when we validated it with uh, epidemiological data sets uh, the region was basically um, uh, identified as the one that 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 was picked up by the model right now using earth observations we are able to provide a prediction lead time of four weeks meaning if we predict or if we provide a value of risk which is low medium and high today for a particular region that will be valid for uh, next four weeks we do it um, on weekly scales and uh, and then on weekly scales this basically goes on to uh, um, uh, this basically goes on uh, goes on for like uh, all all the regions of the world um, um, we we also uh, run it uh, on request, where we basically uh, um, where we basically um, invite uh, a particular region to send us a request on like if they are uh, if there is a concern of of this disease outbreak in in their communities. For example, after hurricane uh, typhoon Amphan in India and Bangladesh, there was a concern of uh, cholera in in that part of the world. So when we Ran our model for four weeks. Um, the the risk appears to be uh, risk appear always appeared to be low, and and then when that happens, that basically means that uh, um, that there was there is not a likelihood of a massive cholera outbreak in in that part of the world. There we will still see a few cases, but those will be self self contained. 
So this was another validation, which is a negative validation that that uh, we, we provided this uh, this information to our stakeholders and users. Um, with this, uh, we were able to provide. Um, uh, assessment of, uh, of of risk of cholera in Ukraine. Now remember, we this this algorithm that we have built is entirely based on the satellite data sets. So it includes the information on uh, uh, on temperature, precipitation, coastal color, ocean colors, and so on. Um, so we were able to identify the locations where the risk of cholera in Ukraine was high. And uh, again, like this information was. Uh, basically shared with our stakeholders and um, and uh, and then the decisions that they made um, were were based on uh, were in part based on what the intelligence that that we were providing it to them. Uh, from here, I would like to basically show the importance of, uh, of of how the Earth observations and especially GeoXO constellation of satellites is going to be useful. Here we have identified several. Um, we have identified six regions, and these regions are, are, we call them the corridors for waterborne diseases. And why do we do that? Because they basically, um, wait, um, um, because they, uh, historically, these are the, these are the regions, um, these, uh, uh, wait. Okay, so I'm just going to leave here. Okay, so historically, uh, we have seen that that a major outbreak of uh, of of, of uh, diarrheal diseases occurring in through these these corridors in uh, in different parts of the world. So um, uh, if we have a global um, uh, uh, global availability of uh, chlorophyll as well as and at a higher resolution and at and at higher hyper uh, spectral resolution we should be able to quantify and do a much better job than than what we are doing um, uh, than what we are doing now um, i would like to show uh, a video here which shows the potential of uh, of, of how earth observations have been used to uh, to identify the exact locations where the outbreak of cholera was likely going to be uh, going to be high. So this is the Sudan region where we predicted that there was going to be a high risk. The red um, the pixels show that the risk of cholera is going to be high. And when we zoom it uh, on on one kilometer over one kilometer, we can basically identify what are the water sources that human population is using. And then we can advise uh, that, that where the caution should be made um, and where the intervention strategies can be developed um, for, uh, uh, for, for basically limiting the uh, spread of, of, of this disease in, uh, in a human population. Um, uh, again, like this uh, information is, uh, we provide this information to our stakeholders um on on request basis and uh, if if there is a sufficient interest then basically we, we monitor that particular region and then uh, um then basically provide them with uh, with with our own assessment uh, can i can i request the next slide please um the next slide okay so um what did what did we do after that? So we have this uh, Vibrio Prediction Hub at University of Florida, which where we host all the data sets, and we basically um, uh, and then these data sets are freely available to uh, um, to everyone. Uh, and then if there are, there are needs, they can send us an email, and we will provide all the portals uh, uh, and then all the access to the to our uh, um, uh, to our basically um, locations. Uh, in this one, uh, if you click, uh, so the data here, the data sets are available on county as well as pixel scales. Pixel scales are are behind a firewall just because the, it's it's a massive massive undertaking, and um, and then it takes a lot of time to basically um, uh, display that those those data sets. But we do have the underlying pixel based data sets with us. Now uh, this this model basically on a on a 
county uh, county scale will give you a time series of what the level of, uh, of of risk will look like in a particular region so uh, here for example in ethiopia uh, for a particular county the, the risk was medium and we have a a, a corresponding um, uh, literature uh, as well as the information as to what that medium value will look like and what to do when the risk of cholera is going to be medium low or high and uh, and in um, uh, in the same document we have the uh, information on activities as to what activities must be prioritized if the risk of cholera is low high or medium so um, so so this is something that that we have developed over the last several uh, several years and the, the best part is that we have used the satellite data set, satellite based data sets to cover this entire globe uh, right now uh, the Africa is becoming one of the uh, uh, one of the major hotspots of cholera and cholera like diseases we are monitoring situations uh, both in the east and the uh, West Africa um, as to like where these new hotspots are going to emerge and uh, and then we are working with our stakeholders to understand that how satellite data sets are going to be used uh, interestingly there was a meeting it's called the uh, USGO which is actually funded in part by NOAA uh, in, in Ghana, where this idea of uh, developing a cross-continent uh, Africa-wide uh, uh, cholera surveillance system was discussed. So we are working with our partners, both in the US as well as internationally to understand that where new hotspots are going to be emerging. Um, here are the um, list of variables, satellites, and the resolutions that we have used uh, starting from uh, uh, from from 1990s and and so on. So um, our our workhorse of uh, development of uh, hypothesis as well as initial algorithms was MODIS, uh, CYFS, and JSON, the Topex JSON, and as well as the AVHRR. Uh, but over time, we switched to VIRS, and now we are looking uh, um, looking for uh, data sets. We are preparing ourselves ourselves for GeoXO as well as for PACE missions. Um, you have approximately 10 minutes left. Okay. So um, this slide here shows um, our uh, shows where we started uh, using satellites and then how we basically, where we are back in like 2020s. So here basically we are, we started with the Landsat and CYFS and then we went all the way to Sentinel as well as the PACE, uh, PACE missions now. Um, our starting point for all waterborne diseases uh, or pathogens is, is the NOAA's uh, ESRL or PSL lab, where we get the initial data sets. And then we basically see on a course resolution if there are links uh, to the pathogens that um, pathogens of concern. Once we do that, then we basically uh, move on to the NASA data sets if it is on a global scale and we use uh, some of the NOAA data sets if it is in the US. So we we are very hopeful that the GeoXO constellations of satellites will become our workhorse uh, um, uh, in the next few years. Uh, now I want you to basically look at this Vibrio map again. So this is a global map. So our idea was basically use our existing knowledge and hypothesis and see if we can determine where uh, the ecological niches of these vibrios will be. And we have used the uh, uh, ecological niche models uh, using various algorithms, and we are working to identify where are the active regions where these pathogens will move, likely move, and where these pathogens will create an issue in human populations. So this is something that 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 uh, that that we have a work in 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 progress. Again, on a global scale, we would not be able to do this thing without the satellite data sets. And now coming home, so Florida Hurricane Ian, we were um, we we were anticipating that there will be ecological uh, shifts in some of the Vibrio species, specifically on Vibrio vulnificus and Parahemolyticus. Uh, given that there will be some movement of water from the coast regions to the inland regions. Um, however, we were not expecting to see 
the vulnificus cases uh, in in Florida um, after Hurricane Ian, which was a little bit, um, which which caught us by a surprise as well. Why? Because our results from Chesapeake Bay showed that there that, that the pathogenicity of Vibrio vulnificus and Parahemolyticus is closely associated with salinity, temperature, and chlorophyll. Chlorophyll means that this is the availability of plankton. So we were, um, while some of the conditions were conducive for Vibrio, uh, Vibrio Parahemolyticus, but we were not expecting that there was going to be a threat, uh, of that level of threat uh, of, of Vibrio Vulnificus and Parahemolyticus in, in the human population. So on this slide, you're, what you're seeing is that the odds of uh, getting um, Vibrio, uh, odds of finding a pathogenic Vibrio Parahemolyticus in water is about four times higher if the chlorophyll values, um, if the chlorophyll values are more than um, let's say like 13 milligram per uh, meter cube. Uh, similarly, uh, for the temperature, uh, the odds ratio states close to like three times all the way up to uh, the temperatures, the sea surface temperatures when they were like uh, 23 degrees centigrade and so on. Uh, we also did the same analysis um, uh, for Vibrio vulnificus. Uh, Vibrio vulnificus is almost always pathogenic. So any identified Vibrio vulnificus is a threat to human population if there are open wounds and if there are um, if if there are if if the population consumes um, uh, consumes uh, contaminated food so a similar type of uh, observation was uh, was seen for vibrio vulnificus in chesapeake bay and when we initiated our uh, sampling process for uh, for matlacha uh, pass in in florida where we had impact from hurricane we found out that uh, while the parahemolyticus was not a concern, which is a good sign because they are often found in oysters, we found that the that there is a considerable con concentrations of the brevolificus in that part of uh, of Florida. This uh, these results are are new. Uh, we we just got them last week, and we are now trying to initiate a. Um, uh, a coast-wide um, uh, sampling protocols uh, that we will be able to understand where the ecological niches of these vibrios exist in the Gulf of Mexico and then in the Atlantic along the Atlantic coast. Now, the mortality rates from vibrio vulnificus are pretty pretty high, so we are concerned about vibrio vulnificus presence in, along the coast of Florida because it is going to impact how the tourism industry or how the service industry will operate uh, within the state and along the coastal regions. So, um, so again, like once we have a sufficient data sets, we are going to be using uh, the, uh, the satellite data sets to develop the uh, predictive intelligence uh, along this coast. Um, back to the future of ocean color. We are now, we are actively working on developing protocols to understand and characterize the functional form and association of these biothreats. We call them biothreats because, um, because they 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 can be used to, uh, or they, they, they are often opportunistic uh, to infect human population and then pose threat to the human uh, to to humans. And we um, right now we we are working with very coarse uh, spectral resolution of uh, uh, of of the data sets that we have. We believe that uh, with the uh, with, with the launch of PACE as well as GeoXO mission, uh, we will be able to get the hyperspectral resolution that we can use uh, to specifically target when, where, and how uh, the speciation uh, species, a particular species or speciation will be linked to the uh, emergence and presence of Vibrio vulnificus, parahemolyticus, and Vibrio cholerae, and it will further help us to enhance uh, to uh, to help us understand the coastal and the uh, ocean bioecology uh, on a movement of these pathogens around the uh, the coastal waters. Um, um, with this, I will basically end with this uh, this slide that how was part. Uh, so we have an ambitious, ambitious goal right now. We we would like to uh, map the entire world, uh, the entire coasts for these pathogens, uh, and we would and we we would not be able to do it without the satellite uh, 
data sets that are going to be available to us in future, especially the, uh, the, the changes in the, uh, um, uh, especially with, 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 with more hyperspectral images. So we are targeting on two aspects right now, Vibrios, where we have a considerable knowledge with us in our arsenal, where we would be, where we will be quickly able to modify our algorithms to include these spectral, uh, high spectral spatial resolution data sets. But the second thing that we are also working on, which we haven't touched it today, is the emergence of bioaerosols. Bioaerosols are a major threat to coastal human population. Why? Because the sea sprays basically uh, takes these uh, these aerosols, which are which often have uh, pathogens associated with it to human population. We are seeing around 20 to 25% increase in pneumonia cases um, in, uh, in, in the Tampa Bay region, which can be attributed to the timing when we have harmful algal blooms and wind speeds. So we are basically trying to get this idea on, on how or what speciation or what species of these things exist along the coastal regions of the US, especially in Florida, because uh, uh, because that's that's what 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 is going to serve our uh, uh, our our testing bed as well, and then we would like to uh, develop this idea of anticipatory decision making. So right now, all the decisions in health domain or health fields are reactionary, meaning we let things happen and then we start to basically uh, make decisions or, or develop intervention strategies. We want to change this paradigm to anticipatory decision-making uh, stuff, meaning that we will be able to form decisions based on what is going to be likely in a particular location. And, and that can only happen if we talk to these satellite launch folks before even the missions are designed, before even like if when, when the missions are launched, because that will help us to basically get a tailored data set um, and more quickly and more uh, and seamlessly that we can integrate in our models. With this, um, I'm, I think I'm I'm at the end of my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antar. Um, I just want to remind everybody to put your questions in the chat, and if you're interested in participating and joining us for future talks, please add your email to the chat and we'll be sure to put you on our list serve. Thank you. Thanks, Antar. That was great. And I appreciate you bringing us to the scale of Florida. I know you're in communication with um, with several of the, the health arms there, hospitals in particular, and you know the potential impact it can have on positive tourism for, um, for awareness. And so um, really appreciate it. Um, I do see some questions in the live note area. Um, let's see from Tim Schmitz. Uh, why is cholera seemingly so randomly scattered? Uh, let's see. In the US. Okay. So yes, I in the US is that the map only shows uh, known locations and that there are many more. I'm wondering what about the hotspot in central Minnesota? Wait, wait. Um, something's not right because um, uh, we just provided a website. Let's see. Oh, oh, okay. Are you able to see that? No, I, 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 I see that. So, okay. So, uh, okay. Th th this is actually uh, not cholera. Yes, that's that's not cholera. It's it's more likely Vibrio wallificus or Vibrio mm -hmm. parahemolytica. So, this is the Vibrio's presence map, meaning all the pathogenic Vibrio wallificus, parahemolyticus, and Vibrio cholerae are shown here. So the, 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 the infection or the, uh, the, the locations in the U.S. are most likely not because of cholera. They will be more likely uh, because of Vibrio vulnificus and parahemolyticus. So, uh, so the thing that you're seeing in, in, in Minnesota would be related to most likely due to uh, Vibrio vulnificus or parahemolyticus. And uh, uh, so, so, uh, so that... Yeah, so that's that that's what is what is happening here. So, um, uh, and I think I know why the confusion is coming because if you click, it shows the cholera infections, which is probably going to be a bug in our metadata. So, so no, that's not cholera. That is that is Vibrio vulnificus and Parahemolyticus. 
Um, so we will correct uh, this one in our uh, uh, in our metadata. So the second question was, how will the time component do? Um, so geostationary perspective will, will definitely give us better coverage and it will be helpful uh, to map the entire coast of US for Vibrio vulnificus and Parahamaliticus and also a new emerging threat on Vibrio mimicus. Um, and, and, and that's that's going to be going to be helpful for us uh, to actually pilot this this entire uh, to pilot this study in the uh, in, in the coastal locations of, of the US. I think it would be helpful to read the question out loud just in case somebody isn't following exactly. And I could take care of that, Allison. Thank you. Um, Tim is with GeoXO Antar. And so um, specifically asking those questions, I think is really informative. Um, GeoXO is uh, is going through instrument selection, but as, um, as our pathfinders are aligned and for our audience to be aware, um, when we work with pathfinders, we try to field information that can inform um, each phase of the mission life cycle. And so as we look to instruments or we look to product development, this feedback is really valuable to missions and product area leads. So um, Tim, I really appreciate you asking that. Um, and we can look into more detail as uh, Antar did state, we're looking at building a value chain with this particular study and making sure that this integrates into Leo, Geo, our products and our services at Nestus. And um, one of the things that we are really excited about uh, GeoXO mission is uh, is the information on air quality, and and the reason that 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 is important is because um, what we have found uh, using our um, uh, in situ collection methods is that that the the biological aspect of aerosols are less studied, meaning. Uh, what pathogens these aerosols carry and what is the concentration of those pathogens uh, that, that can cause the respiratory infections is, is, is understudied um, uh, in, in, within the air quality aspect. So we are targeting to understand if the aerosol transmission um, is, is likely going to create situations for uh, for respiratory infections and that's where we need the global uh, we need at least like the continent-wise coverage of aerosols uh, that's where both uh, geoexo and pace will be very very and extremely helpful for us uh, both that way we will be able to cover both the uh, coasts as well as uh, the coastal waters as well as the, uh, the aerosols in um, in the inland regions Antar, let me ask a little bit about PACE, because you're an early adopter with the PACE mission, understanding very well that you, um, you know, as early adopters, there's there's early access or possibly proxy data. Um, how does that look in terms of a timeline and the kind of information that you will be able to apply to um, future no observations, such as GEO? Is there anticipatory uh, sort of benefits that you can expand on? Um so uh, we we are new to pace uh, pace mission as well like so we uh, the, one of the limitations that that we or one of the challenges that we have for pace mission and the use of data is is that the simulated data sets that 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 are available for pay, from pace mission um, are are not really um, helpful in terms of linking health outputs to uh, um, uh, to, to those, those simulations. So we are working with them to either have an aircraft mission that can provide us with the, uh, with more hyperspectral, uh, resolution of data sets. Um, uh, but, but we are not there yet. So we, uh, uh, so we, ideally, ideally, so ideally, if, if there is a satellite and this is, this is, this is our own personal, uh, interest is that before, after a satellite mission is is designed um, it will really help if users like us or labs like ours are consulted a little bit more aggressively as to find out where or what regions are more susceptible to a certain kind of infections or pathogens so that we can we can assist in like okay well uh, where should we simulate the data sets, where we should get the uh, aircraft missions, drone missions, and all those kinds of stuff. 
So we are we are having that challenge with pace right now. Uh, the uh, and then with the GeoX, so I think I think it will be really helpful if if uh, if if we can uh, or like people like us can be can have a, a voice um, sooner than um, than than later. Right, and, and and the intent of pathfinders, like you're saying, um, this information is is enormously valuable when you can when you can act on it. So as yeah. you're informing the decisions of the mission, um, our pathfinders have that opportunity. Um, one pathfinder, if we're going to be on that particular topic of informing decisions, we did have a pathfinder um, that was able to do a data denial tabletop um, with some simulated data. Um, with GeoExo, and that information, um, you know, was 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 valuable to the Pathfinder in terms of really understanding how the spatial resolution would have impacted resources, um, response time, dissemination of of humans and area burned. Um, in a in hypothetically in a hyperspectral ocean color uh, instrument in Geo, with which is the potential of of GeoExo, um, what, what are you, what are you seeing? I mean, I know this is exciting, but pace is polar. So again, kind of back to Tim's question, we're moving from polar observation back into geo So, um, being able to understand that it may be not necessarily now in this discussion, but even through sort of data denials and, and tabletop exercises, understanding the ripple of that downstream to the health community in coastal Florida, um, information like that is really useful from the perspective and the relationships that you would have. So, uh, for, for example, like, um, uh, again, like it comes down to the in-situ data set. So uh, the current pathfinders that that that, uh, that that you guys have on your website, like the air traffic data sets and the wildfires and all those things, th those are exciting. But again, like those are known regions with the, with the, with the health outcomes. It, it is a little bit, it becomes a little bit iffy. For example, um, we're not going to see these pathogenic vibrios uh, all the time. We're not going to see the influenza cases all the time. So let's say like if we are dealing with aerosols and we are, um, and then the data sets that, that we have uh, is, is, is from March uh, of, of 2020, where the issue is right now in August of 2020, we would not be able to get get anything anything done with that one. Also, with this idea of the polar and geostationary satellites, what what we would like to do is to take the power of both PACE and GeoXO and see if we can cover the entire globe. Um, uh, in particular, for the Gulf of Mexico region, I think GeoXO will be immensely helpful, uh, both to identify the dead zones. Uh, and then both to identify hypoxia regions on a very small, uh, spatial, very finer spatial scales as well as on the spectral scales. Our idea, our hope is that the hyperspectral images can be linked to a specific um, uh, plankton type, which which may not happen, which may not happen. But but that's that's what is going to be our hope. So I may, I, I skipped this slide here. Here we have done the, exactly the same thing. We have uh, two spectral resolutions uh, at, at 555 and 412 nanometers. And we are basically linking those things with, with the core of Vibrios in the water system. If we have a finer resolution, now this is, uh, the, the bandwidth is around like 10 nanometers here. If we have better spectral resolutions, we should be able to get, uh, we should be able to quantify more than less um, in, in coastal waters. Does that? Does that that's, that's that's very helpful and I think it just it opens the discussion for for more questions which is wonderful um we are running close to the top of the hour antar so um as as I see some keyboards and uh you know some movement and ellipses with possible questions we will collect those and um, send them to you to see if there's any more specific details we can provide the audience. But I wanna thank you for that. And I wanna thank you um, everyone for participating, for joining our speaker series. Uh, we do have our speakers come on every four to six weeks. And so we will have another speaker series in the future. Uh, please keep a, an eye out for the Meet the Users Nesta speaker series. And uh, again, Antar, thank you so much. Allison, thank you to you and your team um, for the technical standup and moderating. and. 
have a uh, wonderful holiday and, uh, and Christmas, everyone. Antar, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. And I hope to have a more vibrant discussion with you guys uh, in, in future. Okay, so there is a, a question. I did see that one. Okay. Um, Why do we send this one oh, to you? Race for surveillance. Oh, that's my favorite. I, I do want to uh, address that. Um, I do want to. Oh, oh, okay. So, um, uh, Alex, so we have a we have an algorithm actually that identifies at 500 meter resolution as to where we should be doing wastewater surveillance for uh, for covid for uh, sars cov2 i will be more than happy to send you that manuscript that will be really 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 helpful to get your uh, uh, get get your feedback on on those studies we so okay so this is even bigger now so this is this is something that 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 is that is exciting. We we are working with folks in Ghana where they have found uh, vibrios in wastewaters uh, wastewaters for first line of, uh, of of sewer systems, and that would be something where we think satellites can be really helpful. Um, it's uh, it, it would be a it would be a no one will be hit. okay. So it will be really helpful for us to connect with you folks if you guys have that interest uh, in, in, in wastewater surveillance. Um, we, we're working with Illinois and, uh, and in Maryland to, to quantify uh, this, this, to identify this idea that, well, how satellites can guide targeted wastewater surveillance for pathogens. And this is based on this idea that human behavior can be tracked using climate weather modalities and sociological behavior can then be linked to um, uh, to uh, to identify to the social vulnerability of population in different communities. Uh, again, it's a very interesting exercise. We can uh, we we I would be a, I would be in touch with you uh, over email uh, on on this one. Um, uh, the other thing is, since you are an epidemiologist, uh, you are aware of this index called SOVI, S-O-V-I. This is the Social Vulnerability Index by CDC. Um, we think that needs to be improved, and we think that the satellites can form a, a key component to revise this SOVI index, the Social Vulnerability Index. So um uh, i'm going to say if 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 someone can share those emails with with me that will be really helpful and i'm super excited about this wastewater surveillance stuff which we were not expecting that we will we are about 86 percent accuracy in identifying those locations That's for sars cov2 and and we want to improve that and i think there is there is a, a potential to improve on on that one and we have one paper published and one going out so if uh, Vanessa, please, uh, can you can you share? Absolutely. That'll all, be, that'll be helpful. all of this is captured. It's also recorded, and it goes on our um, our user engagement uh, website for speak for meet the users. Antar, um, we we've, we've kept this recording because you know the interest and you know broadening this and making sure that we get to the details of of the relevance and the societal benefits is essential. So um, we do have Alex's email there. There are other emails that were shared. We will capture all of it and uh, and make sure that this recording is also available for anybody that had to go. Uh, yes, that will be that will be helpful. Um, the the wastewater surveillance system on a global scale could be a reality in ten years, and and that will be super exciting um, to to us. That's awesome. Uh, so, all right. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Wonderful, Alex. Thank you for that great question. Um, Antar, thank you again. Um, really fantastic. Uh, I, I love that it ended with such great energy. So um, I look forward to future conversations. You and I will follow up. And to everyone, again, thank you so much for your support and participation. Um, please let us know if there's particular topics um, that we should be bringing to the table to capture you know, your particular role in our data services and, uh, and our products. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, have a great December. Antra, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Take care. How do I log off?